share the screen. And here we go. All right, can you see it? Yes. Yes. Okay. Oh, just what I would love to be doing. <laughs> well, I don't know. It's a little beachy up here. It's 91 degrees in Ottawa today and also oh, to my. tomorrow. So they've broken all sorts of records. Um, and some people are on the beach, <laughs> but not but not us. So let's see. Here is our text for this evening. And um, would someone like to read that for us, please? It's a long text. Patricia. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. It's kind of it's small. Small for yeah. my ancient eyes, but I will get the Bible right here. Okay. John 21, 1 to 20. Yes. Mm. Jesus appears to seven disciples. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. And he showed himself in this way. Gathered together were Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, we will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, you have no fish, have you? They answered him, no. He said to them, cast the net to the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it and now they were not able to haul it in because there were so many fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on some clothes for he was naked and jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came in the boat dragging the net full of fish for they were not far from the land, only about a hundred yards off. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now, none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and to go wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. He said this to indicate the kind of death by which he would glorify God. After this, he said to him, follow me. So this um, text I'm sure is familiar to most of you. Um, what you may not remember is that it is not 
the original ending of John's narrative. Uh, <clears throat> so in, at the end of chapter 20, John's gospel says, now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may come to believe that he is the Messiah, the son of God, and that through believing, you may have life in his name. So last, uh, last week, Joe talked about the additional endings to Mark's gospel. And um, this one was an add-on as well. And I'm going to later in the evening talk a lot about um, a lecture that was given by Diana Butler Bass in 2019 on this text at the Wild Goose Worship Group Conference. So she is uh, a sociologist of religion and can kind of contextualize what was happening in the Joannine community when this was written. But first, um, I really want to tap into your memories of having heard this text preached um, over the many years that you've been sitting in churches. And can you uh, remind me, for example, what you think was the most important message from, from this gospel? What do you think was the point from, from this 21st chapter? Feed my sheep. Okay, feed my sheep. So this was <clears throat> an instruction about uh, mission, purpose. Caring for people. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. How else have you heard it preached or what's, what's your memory? Well, what do you like about it? <laughs> How many of you are campers? I think breakfast oh, yeah. on the beach is fun. Yeah. <laughs> Fresh fish. My dad used to catch pickerel or walleye, I think the Americans call it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> I like it because it's so quirky. Um, it's so odd. I would call it odd. I think this is why, one of why the... Is it odd? Why is it odd? Well, um, is this... <laughs> Putting you on your think clothes of and as jumping a in the water. Yeah, well, there is that naked thing, and then there is the 153 fish. What, do, what does that have to do with anything? Um, I have heard it preached um, about oh, well, the poor disciples were so bereft, they went back to fishing because they didn't know what else to do. Um, exactly. What else? I, I have a sort of a, an odd thing. I think sometimes now of the thing about Simon Peter, someday when you were old, someone will fasten your belt around you and take you where you don't want to go. You know, and I think of the time when my mother needed to go to a nursing home. Mm -hmm. And I think this happens to all of us. There will be a time when we may have to go where we don't want to go. So I, I always hear that bit at the very end with a bit of foreboding. Yes, it's very poignant, isn't it? Yes. And especially in um, coming from Jesus, who ended up going where he didn't want to go mm -hmm. also, but not having lived a full and long life. Um, so there is that. I'm kind of tickled by the idea that Jesus pops up. <laughs> and um, I, I have some hopes that he keeps on doing that. <laughs> I find good. that part reassuring. Good, good. And in odd places, maybe. Maybe um, it's not odd for them, but I just... Um, that would be think... absolutely most ordinary. Yeah, and we don't have any other time where uh, he's cooking. I mean, I can't, I can't remember a time in any of the Gospels oh. where Jesus is in the kitchen, you know. <laughs> so um, having him out 
and cooking breakfast for them on the beach is kind of endearing, I think. And what they're, at their day, they're at their daily work. So yeah. Jesus meets us in the everyday. Either he meets us in the everyday or he doesn't really meet us at all, I think. You know, yeah. we, we can't look for the amazing worship experience all the time. Yeah, yeah, good point. I don't, I don't think it's unusual that they went back to fishing. Grief is so painful. And, and you really, uh, my experience in with it is just go and do what you are accustomed to doing for the solace of it, because there is just no other way to react. So... Yeah. No, you just, it is. It's like putting one foot in front of the other. At least you can do something that's familiar, especially when your world has changed so abruptly. I agree. In the very beginning, when did they not recognize him or were they too far away to not recognize him? Well, it says the boat wasn't that far away. I just... Um, hundred yards, whatever. It's just um, who else would be on the beach cooking breakfast? Yeah it's, a, yeah, it's a bit of a surprise that, yeah. Well, it's particularly a surprise <clears throat> since in the chapter just before this, Jesus had certainly showed up and they recognized him and Thomas got to meet him and put his hands in the side and all that kind of thing. So now in chapter 21, they don't know who he is again. So yeah. I, I think that's curious. Right. One of the wonderful things about these narratives is that they, in fact, are not the same. Um, and they, they're, there's a lot of disagreement. You know, sometimes he shows up in bodily form. Sometimes he doesn't show up at all. Sometimes he shows up to... Some women, but then in other texts, they're different women, sometimes to some disciples and then sometimes to other disciples. So there's, there's just a whole rich uh, mixture of these sightings of Jesus, or as one author said, life in the resurrection zone. Um, you never know who you're going to find there. Mm. Well, and I've often thought, too, the, the discussion between Jesus and Peter, I often wonder if um, Jesus was trying to help Peter get redeemed. Yeah, because certainly. Because he denied him three times. Now he was allowing him to um, not deny him. <laughs> so, yes, Debbie, and I, that has been preached. Um, at least more than once, I think, about this uh, reclaiming Peter and his um, the primacy of love. And so we have a bit of forgiveness here, um, extraordinary forgiveness in this little in this little scene too. Okay. Do you think that um, these disciples, in their grief, well, first of all, let me go back a minute. They've only known Jesus a short time. It's not been a long relationship, but it's been a very intense relationship. And they were just really getting in to this whole new way of thinking and acting and behaving. And then they lose Jesus and they're trying to understand him. And then they're, conf you know, well, as you said, they went in their grief to back to something that was familiar. But then Jesus is showing up in different places. And that must be very confusing for them. Very confusing. Mm -hmm. And yet he's there trying to support them and make sure this ministry is established that they don't just say, well, Jesus died and I'll just go back to my own way of life. This is all over with. Yeah, I think, Eleanor, that that's... Um... That's a very good point about the intensity of a short-lived experience, and then things change dramatically. And I think that the gospel narrators are also trying to tell us that the relationship or the definition of the relationship is going to change, and the question becomes then uh, much more about what does it mean? 
Mm -hmm. So if our experiences, if, if these narratives are telling us that the experiences of a resurrected Jesus or the ongoing presence of, of God is different for each one of us, well, then what does that mean? Because Christianity didn't really become the powerful force that it is until this resurrection experience these resurrection experiences and proclamations because there were many others who rose up to be activists against the power of Rome, who led followers who also died um, or were killed in, in these various insurrections or at Masada, for example, or, or in other places. So, um, how is it that we are to understand our experience of Jesus after his death, I guess, is, is part of this question. Mm -hmm. And so it is curious to me that we keep having a variety of showings, I guess Julian of Norwich would call them showings, a variety of experiences. There wasn't just one narrative. Mm -hmm. There are multiple narratives and there were multiple additions to the narratives. So later on in the church's life, it decided, well, maybe we should have added blah, blah, blah. Maybe we should have said um, more about this or more about that. So this is, this is one of those, this is one of those. <laughs> so I'm gonna give us uh, next a little, poem, the first poem, whoops, okay, all right, would somebody like to read um, this poem? Okay. <laughs> Susan, thank you. On that final night, his meal was formal. Lamb with bitter leaves of endive, chervil, bread with olive oil, and jars of wine. Now on Tiberius's shores, he grills a carp and catfish breakfast on a charcoal fire. This is not hunger, this is resurrection. He eats because he can and wants to taste the scales, the moist flakes of the sea, to rub the salt into his wounds. Like more or there? No, that's it. That's it. Good. Good. Thank you. So this is, uh, Janet Morley has a new book out, um, The Heart's Time, a poem, a day for Lent and Easter. So she included this one about the John 21 text. So um, this is a particular viewpoint. What do you think that she wants us to pay attention to? or Michael Simon's a poet, uh, Roberts wants us to pay attention to. I think it states that he's fully resurrected, that he can taste, that he can cook, okay, that he can so be seen. Right, Pamela, so this is a, a bodily thing. Yes. So that was another proof text that we're going to have in, in other locations that um, they're either going to touch him or he's going to eat something. Okay. But there's a compare and contrast, isn't there, with the Passover meal, which is formal and is scripted, liturgically scripted uh, for the Jewish people in terms of remembering their liberation, their redemptive time. And this is informal. So the poet's choice of the word formal, I think is important here, along with bitter, right? The bitter leaves. Yeah. What else, what else is this an echo of for you? But the body is different. 
he's not eating because he's hungry. Mm -hmm. He doesn't yeah. feel physical hunger anymore. Yeah. But this is a, sort of a symbolic meal or a ritual or something. I'm not sure what. Yeah, <clears throat> that's right. That, that point, uh, Patricia, this is not hunger. <laughs> something else. He eats and because he can. Yeah. He wants to taste and savor it. But he is perhaps beyond hunger now. Mm. And what about that last little line? The last phrase. The rock salt in the wounds. Yep, what's that? Well, that's a clear connection to the resurrection, I think. To, say more, to, say more. Well, the way he was treated by the soldiers and by the people who were watching him be killed. Okay, so maybe the wounds are also present, at least mm. from the poet's perspective, okay? What else? Wouldn't um, rubbing salt into wounds uh, really hurt, yeah. but these wounds, it will not hurt? Oh, it really <laughs> hurts, but it also heals. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good point. It purifies. Yeah. But also preserves, right? It's also preservative as well as a healer. And yeah, I, if I ever had anything, a cut or whatever, just getting into the ocean is a good idea, mm -hmm. right? It just, every, yeah. everything feels better. The skin feels better and, and so on. But the, the Sea of Galilee is not a salt sea. Mm. No. It's a lake. It's a freshwater lake. So, oh, too bad. <laughs> Yeah, oh, this, wow. <laughs> this, but this, um, this is a little hint of what's to come, right? With the rest of this passage, because Jesus is going to rub salt into Peter's wounds. Mm -hmm. Yes. All right, and as Debbie said earlier, uh, that's a little piece of healing. because things will change for Peter as a result of that. So, okay, what notes I put on in this uh, text, and I'm sorry for all the typos. I saw that in, the, in my first slide, probably like Patricia's because the text is so light that I didn't see all my errors, sorry. So um, I'll read what I can here. There is a renewal of bodily sensations and sharing food with his friends and maybe hunger for abundance. I'm not sure what I meant uh, by that, but maybe it had to do with the catch in the uh, fish. Yes. Certainly it's not uh, highlighted in this poem, but we'll get to another poem um, in a little bit. So charcoal fire and Peter, we are reminded of the other time when Peter was by a charcoal fire denying Jesus in the courtyard um, outside the temple court. So the wounds of Good Friday, Thomas's need to see. <clears throat> and as someone pointed out earlier, um, they recognize him and they don't recognize him. There's some silence there. Um, and Peter's the one that, as usual, leads with his heart and his uh, words and so on. And there is recognition, but not everybody has something to say. So yes, how often do we go back to the old patterns and our habits to the past where things were familiar rather than entering the mystery of the now or even trusting a future that that will be more than enough. So the message seems to be, at least from, from this uh, brief section, this focus, that we continue to feast. <clears throat> somebody is always feeding somebody. And to forgive. And to accept direction, because that's another piece in this, in this chapter where Jesus is telling Peter clearly what he wants him to do. 
feed, tend, feed. And yes, there is this background um, or almost final piece that it will be costly. Mm. It may take them to places where they do not want to go. So this is uh, another scene where there's an edge. There's an edge between land and sea. There's an edge between memory and reality and the edge of belief and disbelief. So it's a very interesting text. So let's look at a little bit of art that I found and then we'll get into another, um, we'll get into another poem. So this, this is- got to be my all time favorite poster. Yeah, John August Swanson. I've done EFM reflections on this. It's oh, wonderful. Good. Well, then Patricia, please help us uh, with this beautiful piece. Did you count all the fish? <laughs> did, the kids, did, you make the, did, you, did you make the kids count all the fish? Is there something that you want us to, to know about it? I just think it's wonderful. It's so colorful and so sort of abundant. Yeah. To uh, me, the rain, sorry. Go ahead. To me, the rainbow of, of colors speak of diversity, good and opportunity, and hope. Excellent. Well, thank you. <laughs> well, we don't have. Um, <clears throat> very much art in the history of this text that shows empty nets. Mostly what the artists like is the fact that the nets are full. And that's a piece that we haven't talked about um, so much yet. That, um, you know, they went out and they went back to, to something that was their livelihood that would bring them food for their table and they were unsuccessful. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's a little scary when you are depending upon sustenance. We could say right now that the situation in the US and increasingly in Canada around baby formula. Mm -hmm. So families are, can't find what they need. And what are we gonna do about it? So Jesus um, tells them to kind of throw the net on the other side of the boat. It's like, really? <laughs> I mean, don't you find that a little odd? Children, you haven't caught any fish. Try throwing your nets over on the other side. Can you imagine the response? Or I can imagine my response, I guess. I would say, oh yeah, I did that. We did that. You think we only fish from one side of the boat? You know, whatever. But what is the echo here from their time with him? Well, he called them to be fishers. That's right. I will make you fish for people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was an invitation to a different kind of abundance. Yeah. yeah. I just noticed that the sky is different on either side of the sails. Okay. That it's uh, bright sun, and then it's open sky with birds. And I don't know if that's a mammoth crab or if it's a heart <laughs> with hands. Oh, it could be fingers. Oh, this is a fascinating thing. Well, it also looks a little like a quilt, doesn't it? Yes. Very. Very. The net really looks like a quilt. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So not just hope, but reassuring, because a, a quilt is a comfort. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering when we are trying to bring people to Christ and we cast the net on one side, it doesn't work. I'm sorry, Nina, I can't hear you. 
I said, when people are trying to... Something happened to the sound. Can you hear me now? I can. I can. I okay. can. Okay. All right. So... Can you hear now? Yes, I can hear you now. Go ahead. Okay. When you're working with people and trying to bring them to Christ, who are totally unknown for that, and you cast words out and they don't work. You cast your words on the other side and okay. they might work better. Okay. Yeah, in other words, don't give up. Keep trying. Right. Yeah, try a different way. Mm -hmm. And we will hear in other uh, sections of scripture that Jesus talks about persistence, doesn't he, and perseverance whether it's in prayer or whether um, it's in other struggles to heal people. We couldn't cast out the, you know, the disciples come back. We couldn't cast out the demons, blah, blah, blah. And he sends them back, you know. So persistence, yes, is, is part of that. And the other word, uh, P word made famous in the pandemic is pivot. So pivot, yeah. You, oh. you, you have to uh, be prepared to change your, accustomed way of doing something perhaps in order to have the results you want yeah well i think if you ask um that's a great point um patricia and that's also what's going to happen in this certainly what's happening in this in this section um people can type in john august Swanson into Mr. Google's search engine to find more beautiful examples of, of John Swanson's work, biblical mm -hmm. paintings. All of them are bright and um, full of life. And if you're coming to All Saints on Sunday in the Sunday school display in the corridor, you will see the poster. Excellent. Because Excellent. The, ch the children talked about this a couple of weeks ago. Is it from Seasons of the Spirit curriculum? I think so. Yeah, okay. Wonderful. Well, here's another interpretation. Just, I just liked it. Um, I think because it's simple. What, what do you guys see in this one? I see a determination in the face of those men. Okay. Strength and and um, almost a, a humble pride. I see those um, kind of sweaters that they make and use yes. in Scotland. <laughs> yeah, oh, those beautiful, heavy. Um, <clears throat> Aaron, Aaron sweaters. Yes. Yeah, those with those patterns. Yeah. Those those <laughs> patterns are um, family patterns. That it's so that when or if the fishermen die at sea, they will be identified by the pattern of their sweaters. Mm -hmm. oh, my, oh, when I didn't know that. Yep. I did see in this um, painting. I think one of the things that I liked about it was companionship. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Just really a strength of um, being together in this work. And there's the, the, the so the, the boats are um, on, on land. The tide has gone out. This is a real thing with fishing when the boats are, um, are, are they're floating for a while, but when the tide goes out, they aren't they aren't able to go. And um, that reminds me of Cornwall, where I used to live, and um, where all the boats would be high and dry until yeah. the tide came back in. Who do you know who did this? No, actually, I couldn't find. I there were um, a couple of paintings that I pulled from <clears throat> a source that I couldn't. There was no attribution given, so I'm sorry about that. It looks almost a bit like a woodcut or something. It yes. does, doesn't it? Yes. Yeah. 
I like I also liked it because I I think that the shoreline here in the in the forefront of the painting looked like a bunch of seashells to me. Mm. And I, well, I, I I thought it looked like cotton. <laughs> I don't think there's any cotton there. <laughs> I don't think there's any cotton in the sea. But look at the little puffs of white. That could be cotton. Yeah. White rock. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I just liked it. It seemed more primitive and and um and also very tightly focused. So it's more workmanlike, isn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, their basket full of fish. Mm -hmm. Yes, and there's some fish left in the boat too. Oh, yeah. right. Yeah. Okay, here's another one. And you see this one? Mm -hmm. I had to expand it a little bit. This I, I think was pulled from a church school curriculum. How, how is this piece different? Is that the fire? Yeah. Okay. And that poor little fish is on a skewer right over the fire. Okay. Mm -hmm. Looks like they recognize Jesus. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It looks. There's a there. sort of sense of excitement in it. Yes, there is. Mm -hmm. There's a different kind of energy here. The masts look like crosses. Yes, they do. Yeah. I like that Jesus doesn't look like a little white blonde guy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He looks like he belongs with the fishermen. <clears throat> yes. Yeah. But it, it also looks like the fishermen are saying what Thomas said, my Lord, my God. Yeah. You know, there's, yeah. A, there's an ecstatic appearance. Yeah. Yes, this is much more active than the other two pieces. Um, I mean, in a different way, You're right? Emotionally, uh, different kind of activity. So the first, the John August Swanson piece was a companionship hauling the net in, but you don't really see any particular expression. Um, mm -hmm. Their their focused their attention is focused on on what's in front of them, and the. Um, the other piece seemed to be um, maybe an unspoken communication between uh, the two fishermen. This, this one is quite different, as you said. With some arms raised and exultation. What, what about the posture of, of Jesus's hands that the artist, what is, what is the artist saying about that? Come to me. Ooh. Okay. Yeah. Open and welcome. Okay. His face is, is almost gleeful. Yeah, it's smiling, isn't it? You can, I mean, his eyebrows are up. Yeah. <laughs> so, it's, He's saying, come and get it. Yeah. Look, mm. look what I've got. You got breakfast here. Come on. <clears throat> Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is um, a much more classic representation here. It shows the labor. They're struggling. It, yeah. 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 And they're standing in fish. There's lots of fish in the boat already. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, this looks like really hard work, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. And it's going to take everything they have, which is also an echo of what's being said in the text. It's going to take all your strength. Mm -hmm. What do you think? What do you think is in the background? <coughs> Excuse me. That was hard to see. It was um uh I think it suffered a little bit because I expanded uh, uh -huh. the picture when I transferred it, but there's another boat back there. Oh okay. Oh, oh I see, yes. It, it's okay. almost the same color as the background. Yeah. 
The point um, that you just made about them, uh, this being hard work, um, I think it not only points to you know, the present, so, but it also points to the future of us as people living in the resurrection zone. I mean, the work is hard, but the work is, there is ample reward. There is plenty of, uh, there are plenty of fish in the sea. So you just know where to look. That's a great point, Joe, thank you. I like the fact that there's companionship here too. Um, none of us can, I mean, we can try <clears throat> to do this work alone, but <clears throat> the work of faith is best um, accomplished with each other in, in community. We're supporting, supporting each other. I like the vibrancy and uh, the colors of this piece also. Again, I'm sorry that I don't have the attribution. All right. But all, all these people, all these pieces are missing an important detail. And that is that Peter was naked and then put his clothes on and jumped in the water. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that is such a curious point, I think. Well, and so do you want to talk about that a little bit more, um, Owen, because I, I really, that is one of the pieces that we haven't um, said much about so far. So do you want to say some more? Well, that, I mean, I, I, I don't know much about it, except that perhaps it was cooler and fresher to not to have any clothes on. But when he saw his Lord, he, if there was a a sense of needing to cover up and be be more present as a full fully dressed human i don't know i don't know what do you think you know, one of the things that's curious about about that is yes you can hear uh, i mean commentators said it was common to just be stripped for work um but we're down to the basics but theologically there's something about being exposed mm. um, so whether it has to do with failure and and we hear this kind of redemption um, encounter that happens later in this text what is it about being exposed mm. or what is it can we say that we don't <clears throat> we really don't want to be naked uh, before the the holy one um, or is it only in our full exposure that we see clearly? Is it only yeah. when we mm -hmm. are totally revealed that we can see our risen Lord? All of these are possibilities. We don't really know. And it is curious that um, those details, those mm. funny little details were added uh, to the story. I don't think they're the whole point, but there's there's mm -hmm. something going on. For for those of us who are post Victorian, it's always very curious. <laughs> <laughs> well, my version says he was scantily clad. Yeah, yeah, oh. probably a loincloth, just the way um, we believe that Jesus was crucified naked. Um, that right. all of the artistic just descriptions would not um, would not do that. It's too much, too much of an exposure. Okay. All right, we're going to um, see. Go to this other poem. I think. All right. Okay, now this is um, this is a contemporary book by Mark Oakley uh, from England, and I just I love the title and I love a lot of the work that he included in this book called The Splash of Words. And I'm trying I'm going to shift our direction a little bit with this poem, 
because I'm imagining, I'm imagining what you talked about earlier, what um, that the disciples had been with Jesus and perhaps they were missing him. Um, Dennis O'Driscoll in this poem talks about missing God altogether in a post-Christian culture and a post-Christian world and how that might land um, on people. So this is quite long. This has got a couple of slides. And so if, um, if we could have several voices reading these bullet points, that would be great. And if um, you would read like three or four of them at once, and then we'll go on to somebody else. Um, I'm not sure how to do this. Uh, we could read it by columns. Or by column, that would be fine. Okay. I'll start if you want. All right, that'd be, that'd be could fine. You possibly put it on full screen. Um, sure. Just you, you should be able to spread it out with your finger to make it bigger. Oh, really? Yeah. I can't. At least on my, my iPad, it says just, you know, use your fingers to spread it out and it makes it bigger. And then you can move it around. I can't do that, but that's okay. Not to worry. And it's full screen on the computer. Okay. Well, <clears throat> let's just, let's start and see how, how we progress, okay? So who is going to start? Well, I said I would start, but I leaned on something and lost it. Now I've got it back. So sure, I'll okay. start. Okay. Do the first call. Yes, please. Already, his grace is no longer called for before meals. Farmed fish multiply without his in intercession. Bread production raises, rises, thank you, rises through disease resistant grains devised scientifically to mitigate his faults. Yet though we rebelled against him like adolescents, uplifted to see an oppressive father banished, a bearded hermit to the desert, we confess to missing him at times. Miss him during the civil wedding when at the blossomy altar of the register's desk, we want in vain to be fed a line containing words like everlasting and divine. Miss him when the IV scientist explains the cosmos through equations, leaving our planet to receive on its axis aimlessly a wheel skidding in snow. Miss him when the radio catches a snatch of penchant from some echoey priory, when the gospel choir raises its collective voice to as shall we gather at the river, where the forces of the oratorio, oratorio converge on, I know my Redeemer liveth, and our contented hearts lose a beat. Okay. There's a lot of imagery in this. Absolutely, <laughs> just wait. <laughs> next, next column. I can do it. Okay, Eleanor, thank you. Miss him when a choked voice at the crematorium recites the poem about fearing no more the heat of the sun. Miss him when we stand in judgment on a lank crucifixion in an art museum, its stripe-like ribs testifying to rank. Miss him when the gamma rays recorded on the satellite graph seem arranged into a celestial score the music of the spheres, the Eva Vera corpus of the observatory lab. Miss him when we stumble on the breast lump for the first time and an involuntary prayer escapes our lips when a shadow crosses our bodies on an X-ray screen, when we receive a transfusion of foaming blood sacrificed anonymously to save life. Miss him 
when we call out his name spontaneously in awe or anger as a woman in a birth ward bawls her long dead mother's name. Miss him when the linen covered dining table holds warm bread rolls, shiny glasses of red wine. Miss him when a dove swoops from the orange grove in a tourist village, just as the monastery bell begins to take its toll. Miss him when our journey leads us under leaves of Gothic tracery, an arch of overlapping branches that meet like the hands in Michelangelo's creation. Miss him when trudging past a church, we catch a residual blast of incense, a perfume on par with the fresh baked loaf, which Milos compared to happiness. Miss him when our newly decorated kitchen comes in shaker style, and we order a matching set of Mother Anne Lee chairs. Miss him when we listen to the prophecy of astronomers that the visible galaxies will recede as the universe expands. Miss him and the way an uncoupled glider riding the evening thermals misses its tug. Miss him as the lovers shrugging shoulders outside the cheap hotel, ponder what their next move might be. Even feel nostalgic, old, odd days for the second coming, like standing in the brickwork of the dove coat after the birds have flown. So the poet <clears throat> says that the sense of the sacred has receded. And he names all the places and scenes and moments where the absence of God has become actually a presence in a strange way. The naming of what is missing calls it to mind. So the way in which the echoes in this brief text and John 21, bring echoes to mind, catch, um, eat, charcoal, et cetera, right? Wound. Mm. So it made me wonder what our strongest echoes are <clears throat> and are there things in particular that we maybe missed in, during the pandemic or um, that we think other people are missing. I, I think that this poem is so full of the richness of faith in every place, which is sort of what this Gospel of John is leading us toward, just that God is everywhere, can be found in all sorts of places. Um, but I just, I thought it was quite quite poignant and I wondered um, I wonder what you think about that poem really made you think yeah. I'd be happy to send you the uh, PowerPoint um, in case you'd like to look at it again I it just I could not get that poem out of my head um, well, I find there are people, for instance, who might I might see every week in some secular context, uh, and yet uh, there is missing that same sort of connection with things that that I am connected with, so that I might feel closer to somebody that I might see only occasionally at All Saints Westboro, for instance. But I know that we have that sort of underlying common reference, whether living according yeah. to the church year or, or um, understanding what worship is happening and all that kind of thing. So I think there is, there, you, you realize sometimes when you're speaking to some others, there's a whole gap there that they, if they knew once, they no longer know. 
So yes. I found that quite interesting. Or that, or that you don't, you don't share. We don't share. Yeah. 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 Well, it's kind of sad in a way because you, you, <clears throat> you see all the different places that that we have. I remember, you know, as a young child, I was, I always felt closer to God than I did as an adult, only because I was so busy with life and having to live and have, having to go to work, go to school, do this, take care of my child, do that. And so you missed him in all the little things. And now as I'm in the last few years of my life, the last 10, I've become closer again because I haven't had any children at home. I'm by myself. I can do my studies. I can, I can get closer to him. And yet I should have been doing it all along. And so you feel sad when you're reading it that you missed all those chances. There'll be more. To be close to him <laughs> during the time period. And so that it's kind of sad when you listen to it, but it is... Um, so true. Ooh. I found the line about finding a lump in your breast very poignant because when I found mine, I was out in Vancouver visiting my children and I didn't want to tell them. I was pretty sure because of my family history that it was indeed cancer. But I thought, they want this to be a happy time, everybody together, showing you all the bits and pieces of Vancouver and BC. I'm not going to tell them. But I do remember saying, okay, God, we got to get through this together because I knew that I couldn't do it alone. Mm -hmm. And for some reason I'm not too sure of, I didn't want to lean on people. I'm I, I felt like this was my family heritage. My sisters all had it and they all survived it. And that's what I told the doctors. I'm going to be fine. Just, you know, get in there, get it out. But you were talking about things different in the pandemic. People are not getting in there and getting it out. And that breaks my heart. Mm -hmm. um, one of our people at uh, Julian, her son-in-law had something really serious but because of the pandemic, he waited a year and a half. And it's not just a year and a half of waiting to get something done. It's a year and a half of work not being done. It's a year and a half of worry. And you really need faith and people and a prayer chain support. We're so lucky we're not cut adrift from one another. Even though we don't see one another, we have the opportunity to phone or go. Yesterday, I phoned somebody who I've been trying to support. The last time I was over there, she just got so angry at me that I thought, well, I'm not going back for a while. So I phoned and said, do you want to go out for dinner? And we just went to the diner and had fish and chips and sat and talked. And it was a really good outing. These ordinary outings are not happening. <laughs> well, I can I can hear that the loss of, of community and certainly in the text that we're talking about from John, we are regathering the community and we're going to expand um, the community. And I'm thinking about something that Dee and Kate said at St. John's. Um, I don't know, help me with this, Joe, Susan. It was at least a month or so ago when she said that the post-Christian culture means that the church has many layers now. It has an inner core. I don't know, Michael, you would you probably heard this too and heard it in the staff. Um, that those who have gathered are now the core disciples. Those who are making it their business to be present and then we have layers of affiliation um, kind of these sequential rings um, but the core the core are the people who know know the story um, by Owen thanks for coming um, and that that's a smaller group and that we're going to need to 
maybe reinvigorate uh, the dialogue of where God is not missing. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. It's just what it made me think of. Joe, do you have? Well, just to, just to kind of go along with what you're saying, I mean, it's almost like we are um, fishing on the left side of the boat with mm -hmm. nothing happening. Uh, and we keep wondering, well, why not? And then, you know, then it's a matter of saying Jesus. But then the, but the other thing I was thinking about, one of the lines in the poem, or one of the stanzas, I guess, is about celestial bodies, galaxies, and so forth, proceeding as the universe expands. And what that makes me think of, in addition to that, is the kind of the state of political discourse in the United States, and I suspect in Canada as well, although perhaps not to quite the same extent, where you have people who identify as Christian taking just diametrically opposed points of view and insisting that my point of view is right. No, 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 my point of view is right. And we, you know, and we continue to just, you know, it, to the extent that that continues, then we will recede just like the galaxies and we will be so many light years farther apart than we are already. So I don't know, I, I, I hadn't, when I read the poem the first time, I hadn't really noticed that, but hearing it read aloud helps me so much to, uh, you know, to uh, to get to some of the things, some of the things that the poet's trying to say. So. Thank you. We have a niece who is walking on the pilgrimage from Canterbury to Rome. It's a, a route, a, a route that runs through France, Switzerland, down to Italy. Uh, but she said before she left, uh, I've left the religious part of my life far in the past. And I think to myself, this is a person that's been on the Camino and several other pilgrimages. And she says she's very moved when she goes into cathedrals and churches. So she's just, she's the, she's the narrator saying, I miss him when I yeah. go into cathedrals and see the beauty of that. So there's a residual something, but there's a sort of, uh, I left all that behind. I don't know. I, I wanted to say something, but I don't want to be the bossy aunt. So, well, sir, we'll I don't her. know. You know, I don't want to be preachy. But I do think that there is a search uh, for the sacred. Yes. That we are driven, um, you know, religious aesthetics. We've talked about this before the beautiful, the true, and the good. That's what, how we define religious aesthetics. There is this search for beauty. There is a response um, of awe and wonder when we are in the midst. Um, it's not the same as being in a museum. There is and that something. is our religious life. Uh, to have a religious life or a spiritual life does not necessarily mean to serve on the vestry of your church or to be involved <laughs> with the organizational church. Yeah. Like yeah. that's a part of it, but it's not the whole of it. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's just um, something to think about. And I hope that you'll revisit that poem. I have revisited it several times and it made me want to think about, are there places that I have decided that I'm comfortable with knowing where God is? Mm -hmm. And am I missing God's appearance in other places? So um, this text says uh, something more about Maybe you didn't know what you were missing. Or maybe you didn't know where you were you were missing. Maybe it wasn't God who was missing at all. Maybe it was you. So um, I was thinking about uh, something somebody said earlier about um, not recognizing Jesus after, okay. ha after having a really intense period of time where um, everybody was getting to know each other and and yet they didn't recognize him i'm wondering if anybody has had the experience of being in a very intense friendship or a relationship for a short period of time and then when you have split up and go your separate ways back to your own lives you see that person everywhere you go <laughs> you see somebody and you think oh 
that's, that's that person. Oh, and then they turn around, no, it's not. So it's sort of the opposite. Um, and it's that ah. kind of, that's kind of a missing, isn't it? It's a way of, it's grieving the loss of the person in your life. And, yeah, and it, you, just see, you see somebody who looks like them all the time. Or like somebody who has died, where you catch a sight, it, of, sight of them yeah. in a crowd mm. or, or somewhere. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's an interesting point. Thank you, Edith. Well, I'm going to move on to channel um, Diana Butler Bass now. And I hope, again, you'll check with Mr. Google to find this wonderful address that she gave in 2019 at the Wild Goose Worship Group. That's the Iona community. And she was asked to talk about this particular text. And Joe, I hope that you're going to jump in with me on this because I know you also um, went through it. She just blew my mind in terms of telling us uh, telling her hearers about context. So I, as best I can, I'm going to go through um, this slide and tell you what she taught me. So this is the second ending of John. We talked a little bit about that, written about 20 years after the original text of John's gospel, which makes this text at around 110 Christian era. 80 years after the death of Jesus, just for a time, time frame. So it wasn't written the week after they had breakfast on the beach. Okay, and we <clears throat> remind each other that the Pauline uh, letters are earlier than the Gospels, and this, this Gospel is written quite late. So the context was that Rome had been at war with the Jews from the year 66 to around 136. Again, the people who heard this text or for whom it was written had been in the midst of a civil war. The temple had been destroyed, as you remember, in, in 66. There was violence and brutality everywhere. And believers were living on the edge of despair. The longed for kingdom that Jesus had promised has not happened. And um, one of the things that she said was it didn't matter whether you were Christians or Jews, they were all lumped together as far as Rome was concerned. As far as if you weren't worshiping the emperor, you were going to be killed. So that the disciples were in anguish in a kind of spiritual and physical state where they didn't know what to do, whether what they had hoped for, the hope had faded. And here in this uh, text, even what they knew how to do is unsuccessful. So they can't even fish and get what they need. And they have no, no control over everything. So one of the important details in this text that we have yet to focus on is the Sea of Galilee has been renamed the Sea of Tiberias. This is the same body of water, but now it has been claimed by the state. And so the emperor who killed Jesus, Tiberius, for him, Herod built the city and he named it Tiberius. And he claimed everything, including the Sea of Galilee, with taxes, with demands for loyalty, and everything that they do now is claimed by the empire. In fact, what was caught in the Sea of Tiberias now was sent to feed Caesar. So she told us that at the end of the imperial feast, when large fish, the largest fish were served to the elite, the highest ranking nobleman would stand up and say, I have fed you. Do I have your loyalty? <laughs> this is what he said to everyone who's seated at the emperor's table. Do I have your loyalty? Because I'm the one who's feeding you. 
So in contrast to that, Jesus is, Jesus enters this place on the edge of the sea of despair, and not at night, not in the darkness, but at dawn. And another detail that we didn't talk about that uh, she mentioned um, in the text was that, you know, Jesus already has some fish on the charcoal grill there. And he says to the disciples, bring some of the fish you caught. She says, bring Caesar's fish. And I'm going to feed you with those. You are entitled to eat these fish also. So that the feast of the kingdom is set against the norms of the um, of empire. And in essence, he's saying, you deserve these fish as much as anybody. So the large hall is not the focus of this uh, narrative unless it is to share what we have. And it's not so much about eating physically. Um, proof text in the bodily re resurrection, she says, as it serves for ongoing action, a demonstration of what you're supposed to be doing. Don't forget. Don't forget that this is what I'm telling you to do. Feed my sheep. Tend my lambs. Feed the sheep. So the nakedness, the stripping bare is not about humiliation or shame, but about what it means to be clothed in faith. So as Peter dresses himself for action, he is going to be dressed and taken um, in ministry to far places, even places uh, that he didn't expect or doesn't choose to go, didn't, would not have chosen to go. <laughs> So that the setting of tables and serving all is a following, which will be more difficult than it was before. Um, empire begins wars, uses violence, builds monuments and claims with names on the building, names, renaming things. The gospel will set a table anyway, because that is who we are. So how we love or whether we love is the question and also the answer. Joe, do you want to add? Um, uh, no, except to say that if you, uh, that I highly recommend this sermon. I, you know, there are, I, I shouldn't say this, but there are really, I mean, sometimes I hear sermons and I say, yep, yeah, that was that was good. That was good. And then I walk away and say, well, you know, I don't really remember. So, I mean, sometimes that's not the case. This one was amazing. This was just totally amazing. And the way she set the context of this gospel is just absolutely persuasive. I mean, it's, it's, it's really, really terrific. I think you did a great job of of saying what this is all about, how she went about saying this, but it was, you know, uh, you know, again, I think that there are these two big aspects of resurrection. I mean, who is it that, who, I mean, Jesus is resurrected and that's the model for us. Uh, you know, we, like I said, we are, we, we are going to die. We die deaths every day. Um, in so many ways, and without, there can be no resurrection unless there's a death, and so Jesus is calling us to a new life, a new creation, a resurrected life, and to me, you know, all these stories about, you know, Jesus being resurrected and raised from the dead and so forth, they're, they're important only because that tells me who I need to be paying attention to. I need to be paying attention to what Jesus has to say and what Jesus has to do. And what he does here is, I mean, is much more than what he says. Um, 
So that's what I really, that's what I like about the you know, Diana Butler Bass, um, you know, sermon. She makes that just so clear. Um, and by the way, this is the Wild Goose Festival in Hot Springs, North Carolina, not in Iona. Hey! Oh, one wonderful hey! And you can, if you really want some, if you're, if you're tired of the 91 degree heat, come on down to Hot Springs, North Carolina, where it's only about 75, so. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, I just, it, it just blew my mind. Thank you um, for endorsing that, and I hope other people will take could advantage you, of that. Can you remind us again where the sermon is from? <laughs> It's 2019 Wild Goose uh, oh, yeah. Conference. And you can find it on YouTube. That's yeah. where yeah. it's yeah. And just, uh, and Diana Butler Bass. But the, yeah. what, uh -huh. what struck me so powerfully was her setting of the context and how the parallel context from 110 <laughs> B -E, uh, BCE, no, not BCE, Common Era, uh, AD, um, really fit the political situation in 2019 and also yeah. now, mm -hmm. you know, and it just blew me away. If empire is stealing and claiming everything belongs to the state or, you know, we're the government or we're going to put another Trump sign on another building and claim another golf course or we're going to do whatever, um, it just... It just stunned me that in the face of that, in the face of the claims of empire, who are we as Christians, as, as the body or living in the resurrection zone? What are we supposed to do? And I think even though the gospel of Mark, the, the shorter ending of Mark, you will recall ends with the women going to the tomb, wondering who's going to roll the stone away, and they find, oh my gosh, there the stone is rolled away, and there's this guy sitting in the tomb telling them, Jesus has been raised. He's not here. Go to Galilee. You'll find him there. And what do they do? They are dumbstruck. They're all they're amazed and terrified. I think that th th that was written 40 or 50, 45, 50 years earlier than this epilogue to John. Yeah. And, but the, but the Roman Empire was still very, very similar. Remember that in Mark, you know, we're dealing with the Neronian persecution of mm -hmm. uh, Christians uh, because of the, the fire in Rome that had to be blamed on somebody. And, oh, why don't we blame the Christians? Yeah. Um, so with, with no evidence at all, uh, but that's what happened. And so it's the same kind of thing. And I think really the same question is being asked, what are you, what are you going to do about this? Are you're in the situation of the women? You found that Jesus has been raised from the dead. That's wonderful. Now what? What, what are you going to do about that? So I think it's the same kind of situation. Let me finish with these last few slides. So after um, that lecture, <sighs> then I started to listen for despair, for desolation. Mm -hmm. who, who painted this? Um, I'm not sure. There's a signature in the bottom left. Again, I got this. I think I got this on Unsplash, actually. Which is a free source. <clears throat> and what we have here is um, to pick up where Joe left off. This is, here are the women. And I want to say it took me a while before I found the child. Where's the child? The child is in her arms, the woman who is bent over and weeping. Mm -hmm. 
I oh, thought wow. laundry at first because I thought this was a laundry basket. But then I looked again and saw, no, it's a, it's a babe. Yeah. Yeah. So my, it meant that my reflections had to do with um, despair for multiple generations. Mm -hmm. That could be anything. It could be war. It could be disease. It could be famine. It could be anything. So it could be loss. Mm -hmm. one sort of another but there is also that the older woman has seen it all or has seen yeah. a lot and so she knows that um one can I like endure. that the older woman is looking out to the light yeah both of those comments very important you know reminds you of Vermeer right mm -hmm. the face is always turned toward the light or or even Rembrandt where the source of the light is always important. It always directs the eye. <laughs> and so in, in some sense, because we miss the child on the first glance, we miss the infant. Um, it invites us to think about uh, what our actions will mean to another generation. So if we're talking about making sure that God is present for the ne next generation. I think it was John Westerhoff, whose book was, Will Our Children Have Faith? Mm. And but he says they, they will have, uh, the only thing you're responsible for is seeing that you have faith. You're right. Ultimately, it is not your fault if your children drop away from the faith, but mm -hmm. you have the responsibility to be faithful. Yourself. Mm. Yourself. So that you're a witness, that you have a witness. So what, what the act, I'm sorry? When she said that, I said it reminded me of turning kind of the child the way he should go and he will not depart. Oh. I have seen people that did not go to church for 40 years or more, and they went back. What it really meant when they went back. But looking at this picture, right off when I saw the baby, I thought that's a mother that can't feed her baby because she can't get the, the food. Right. That's a baby, a mother now who can't get the infamil formula. <laughs> Her formula was probably breast milk, but. Now it's not. The mothers often need to have the, the baby formula. Yeah. And if I I know if I was sitting there with a the baby and couldn't feed it, how distract I, I would just be awful. But my mother would have put her hand on my back and said, We'll work this out. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Nina. So again, um, I'll leave you with um, <clears throat> these last couple of slides, personal contexts, uh, contemporary contexts. Uh, despair, despair has many faces. Sometimes what we knew how to do is no longer what's required. We may need to step up and do something different. We may need to find other resources in ourselves where we may need to find somebody to partner with um, that has resources that we don't. So we may need to reconfigure what faith looks like for us here and now, um, not as an ultimate goal of heaven as some of us were taught, but what kind of God are we missing and can we help locate uh, in the now? So there, these are just a few questions, how your faith has been sustained. Um, how is it that you've nurtured your own faith to do for others? Can you, have you been able to set a table of welcome or how, how has that happened? Um, and can you identify how you want to stand against uh, empire? And when, where, where is that in the world? In, 
local, regional politics, whatever. So it's all ultimately, can we love each other well? And Jesus's last statement, which is, follow me. So the last piece is um, response, relief, restoration. This is uh, Coder, K-O-D-E-R, the painter, Coder, who died uh, as a Catholic priest. Um, I've used his work before because I find it so vibrant and so just so full of color and of the whole human community. So that's his welcome table. Um, certainly with the Eucharist, and you can see that there's a, a face of Jesus represented in this uh, jug of wine. And then that little piece some of you have seen, um, that's my uh, Ukrainian angel that um, I did in response to this crisis, and it's in cardstock and is for sale at uh, the cathedral bookstore with all the money going for um, Episcopal Relief and Development. So it's the only, that was my welcome table. <laughs> um, so anyway. So oh, that's uh, really packed, um, hour and a half, and um, multiple things to think about with this little chapter from the Gospel of John. Thank you for coming. Joe will be doing next week. Um, you want to prep them? Joe, for the next? Uh, next week, um, we will be talking about Mary Magdalene. Um, so, I won't say anything more than that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and then, and then the week after that, it's probably, I think it's going to be Thomas, but it may just be the locked room. Um, we'll talk about things that we we try to lock things out, you know, based on fear, whatever. And then the last session we'll do together, and we're going to kind of um, do what we often do in our last sessions. Joe will do half, and I'll do half, and I'm already thinking about something pretty wacko for my part. <laughs> Be wacky, <laughs> Joe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he knows, he knows. He's already, um, so another place... Uh, Another book of resurrection, but it's not in the Gospels. That's all I'm going to say about my part for that week number five. So be there or be square, as they used to say. Anyway, um, thanks so much. And, Thank you uh, so much. I, Thank, I you. Thank, you. You all, Thank you. I hope you all have a great week. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye.